Welcome back to the This Week in Fantasy podcast. I'm your host, Venom Astaire, and I have a very prestigious guest with me coming off of a win. It's my 2v2 partner and cousin, Spencer. Spencer, how are you, buddy? Doing good. Glad to be here. Let's go through some last week's matchups. Let's do it. So there was no week one. We're going to jump right into week two. But we're going to spend just a little bit extra time looking at each individual team since there was no week one episode. And going forward, I think that the episodes will return to being weekly. So after winning in week one, Weston faced off against me, who had also won in week one. The game was relatively close, but I came out here victorious. Devin Singletary got about a dozen. Will Lutz had a good day considering that the New Orleans Saints couldn't really score, but they kicked a few field goals. Tom Brady was excellent. He looks great with Antonio Brown. And Julio Jones popped off late in a big way to secure the Falcons a victory, as well as many of his fantasy owners. Spencer, what did you think about this game? Uh, yeah, it was an interesting game. Um, Walker had a really, really good week one where he scored 20, and I think Weston was feeling pretty good about Waiting on tight end, waiting on tight end, but I really feel like a lot of these guys, like it's kind of they're going to be up and down at times, you know, the the not top guys. So uh, I think last week that was kind of you know that kind of what is what cost him the win to some extent. Little production from that. Woods has been truly awful through the first two weeks as well, falling up another poor performance um, for you know his ADP. Um, but he did start out at the same pace last year and ended up as one of the top scoring guys, so I'd expect him to, to finish strong down the stretch. That's interesting. Did you watch the Dallas game versus Washington? Parts of it, yeah. Did you watch the parts where Joe Buck was hyping this guy up to the high heavens? Scary Terry. Yeah, Scary Terry. He had a good game, but... He's one of those guys that the cat, the casters get briefing on in the pregame. Yeah. They're like, this guy's an emerging star. He has, like, a really catchy nickname, too. Like, like I swear to God, like with Mahomes last year, it was like if you had a drinking game where it's like every time they said the phrase showtime Mahomes while watching a Chiefs game, you'd be, like, on the floor by halftime. Like, it was like they tried to fit that in, like, every other word. And it sounded like a, a lesser version of that with him. Yeah, sometimes things can really be forced. Like, a lot of times, someone will get a nickname that's not really that good, and people just use it over and over, especially if they're new. But anyway, the Scary Terry guy, he's emerging in the sense that Washington doesn't really have any good receivers. Deshaun Jackson left, so this guy can sort of step out and be the main target for Keenum. Yeah, the Redskins are going to be playing from behind a lot, so their receivers are going to be good. And yeah, I think he's going to be the number one guy. He's getting the volume. You know, he'll be a solid uh, surprise. Weston isn't starting him, maybe. But what is this? Probably is pretty stacked up top. Woods, yeah. Adams, Calvin he's, Ridley. I'm kind of in the same situation where I feel like DJ Metcalf as well as uh, John Brown are both, like, getting a ton of volume and consistent. And on most of t- other teams in our league, they'd be starters. But – just too stacked at wide receiver. It looks like Weston's in a similar position. All right. So overall, this victory launched me to 2-0, and which is a great position to be, as everyone knows, because when you go into your third divisional game in a position to sweep, it makes tie scenarios going into the later weeks of the season look way better for you. Weston historically has a very one-sided record against me where he often reigns victorious to a very high degree and these last few years I've been putting up wins against him whereas in the past I had been swept a lot so that's interesting to see because I think when a lot of people look at the first division the cursed lands they think it's me and Weston are going to be the front runners usually do you think that's a fair statement it's Lily and who's the other person Seagouch I mean Seagouch will put up good years uh, every so often but yeah I, I typically think it's at least in recent years, it's between you and Weston more often than not. Right. Okay, so moving on to the other divisional game of this division, the Cursed Lands. We had Seagouch squeaking out a win against Lily, who basically started Drew Brees when he got hurt before he could even do anything, and she lost by only two. So Seagouch got a huge break here. Yeah, for real. <laughs> yeah, I, 
I didn't even follow this game that closely, but yeah, Breeze got negative and he lost by, or uh, he won by like barely any, like a point without negative points. Yeah, he would have been up like a point going into the going into that game. So yeah, that, that was crazy. Well, remember he got hurt early on in the game before he could do anything, and yeah. that sometimes you have a player who puts up decent numbers and then gets hurt in the fourth quarter. But when your quarterback goes down early, it is such a hard thing to overcome. Yeah. Yeah, Lola's team actually looks surprisingly strong around around that, though. Like, 22 out of Beckham, 21 out of Jones. Cooks did well. And there's a lot of interesting pieces here. What, what we've kind of found, and we, we've had discussions about this in the past, Lily actually drafts very, very well. Um, it's just kind of in – a lot of the Watsons we've noticed over the years are not the best managers. Um, she like hasn't really filled in very well around around the edges. Like you look and outside of her quarterbacks, like her bench her bench combined for like like three points. Like her other non quarterback players, like if she would do a better job of filling in the edges, like you know she would be a very scary person who's you know one or two waiver wire pickups and all of a sudden her team like looks pretty good. I also think it's kind of ironic that she rostered three quarterbacks and, like, somehow that actually became, like, not viable, we'll say, but, like, not egregiously awful as, like, one would expect with now it going works. down early. Yeah. It works now. So, looking at this game, Beckham finally had his pop-off game. He played a team in the Jets that went from New York pundits saying they were going to go 9-7 and seven. So now the New York pundits, after a couple weeks, are saying it's going to be 0-6 and, and then God knows what. This team is bad. It was a team that got a lot of injuries in the first week and their quarterback got mono. And now basically the whole situation, except maybe Lev Bell, has just become a complete disaster. Yeah. A Jets, I mean, even, even Bell, like he's going to have a limited touchdown upside. I think Robbie Anderson is a really interesting uh, player. For the Jets, simply because you know they're, they're you know they're bad, you know they're gonna have to be playing catch up, and what better way to play catch up than throw it deep to a, you know a go route type of guy, but like even then like they're gonna be so bad at like, even, he has limited value. I just he's the only guy I really feel great about. Like I I, I uh, we had a lot of discussion on Bell before the season started, and I said like man. I don't really buy into his, like, I was kind of thinking of McCoy for Buffalo. Like, remember how bad he was, like, a couple of those years? Yeah. Their team was just so bad, he could, like, they would just stack the box against him, and they there really was no threats anywhere else, and I kind of got the same vibe from Bell, you know. And first round ADP, like, early to mid first, I, or it's probably mid to late uh, ADPs. I, I just wasn't in love with him compared to your other options. And when I look at Seagouch's team, I see some decent positives. Zeke, of course, did very well in his game. The Cowboys' offense, it looks very good. They have another soft matchup this week, and laughable the, the Miami fans up. Those Miami fans, those poor bastards, not only do they have to deal with this fins up thing that the team account is constantly promoting and hashtagging, and it's just horrible. The team might not win a game, Spencer. I mean, the Dolphins this year or a laughing stock, and anyone with any value is pretty much demanding a trade. Yeah, I mean, there isn't a Dolphin worth starting. Like, I, I would argue there's almost no Dolphins worth even rostering on your bench. <laughs> like, like what are they going to do? Like, all of a sudden become good? Like, even, like they can't even – it's like a lot of teams on – like a lot of bad teams, like some of their receivers have value because they're going to play catch up a lot. But the, the Dolphins are so inept that, like, they're not even, like, good at playing catch-up, right? They're not even going to score garbage touchdowns. It's really appalling from a fantasy point of view, at least. So that means I think the Cowboys are going to have a great week, not to get ahead of ourselves, but it's looking good for the boys when they're playing the Dolphins. Let's wait till the mashups this week before we go too much into that, but yeah. Fair enough. So this game, Seagouch escapes. That's the headline. Seagouch is just brutally close to going 0-2 here. And Lily starts off 0-2. So then we have Sam, a team that I don't really think is worth anything this year, facing off against Clap for Bacon, an old-school guy who's showing some promise. He took Mahomes in the first round, and Derek Henry, Nick Chubb are his one-two running back punch. You have 
have some receivers after that, Keenan Allen being consistent, Ted Ginn being more boomer bust. And then the new guys, to me, this is just a bunch of tier two players. What do you think about this game? Yeah, I'm, I'm not super high on Sam's team. I didn't even think he made any, like, egregious picks. Um, like, he was taking people around the right ADP more or less, but I felt like every pick I'd seen, like, oh, that was a bit of a reach. And, like, what you don't realize is when, when, when you notice that, you know, a lot of times that means that, like, over time it kind of compounds on itself. So he ended up with, like, a bunch of players that we'll say are, like, a tier below where he should have relative to, like, where he drafted them, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I just – not a huge fan. I think there'll be better days, but I would say he's going to be below 500 probably on the year. I think he'll take a couple wins. His bench has some has some, some interesting names on there. Gore with the Singletary injury this week will be really good. I think he got, like, 20 carries last week. Wasn't super pr productive with them, but, like, I mean, 20 carries is, is tough to, so yeah, at the bottom, 20-plus 20, 20 carry outing. Uh, t when you get 20 carries, I mean, even if you get three yards of carry, that's still six points, and you punch it in once, that's 12, and that's all you can ask for from a flex guy, right? And Kirk's kind of interesting, you know, developing young player. Fair enough. I love how Kevin does the double homer Cowboys special teams of the kicker and the defense. That's just, it's so beautiful in the sense that it really does boil this league down to how I always remember it being even in 2007. A lot of people really go hard on their affection for the Cowboys, and this is one small example. We can see here that the commission actually put up two players who put up a goose egg in the week. What are your thoughts on this, Spencer? Uh, I, I don't hate the Gen start. Like, he had a good week. There wasn't a ton of volume there. The Jeffrey, like, I could be wrong, but I, I thought going into that game that Alshon Jeffrey, like, was slated as not playing. I, cu I could be wrong, but to me, that was just bad management. He should have picked in. He should have picked up a guy to, uh, I guess not. I guess he did play. He said he exited. But, yeah. To me, I mean, I guess if he didn't know, then that's fine, you know, but it is kind of bad to have two guys putting up zero, even in a you know, unlucky week. He does get away with it, with it, though, because of Sam's ineptitude. We see Diggs, who's a tier two, second option, not breaking 10. You know, I'm not really a big Mike Evans guy. I know he can be explosive. I know Tampa Bay likes to air it out. I'm just losing faith in Jameis Winston every game he plays. He makes too many mistakes. Yeah, I mean, I had him, and I, I dropped him just because I, I felt pretty good about Josh Allen, and I wanted to get some of the budding young receivers and running backs on the wire. Um, I I actually think there'll be better, better days for the Bucks. I mean, the thing is, things can't get worse, right? Like, they haven't been really really using their weapons. OG Howard had zero points last week. I think they'll start to use him more. Mike Evans, I think, is, is still a really talented player in his prime. Um, you know, they've got other, other talent, like they've got a lot of other talent, um, not on defense, but on offense. And so I think it's hard for them not to get, uh, not to get better, you know, but I, I don't, they're not as good as I was kind of projecting them. I was kind of projecting them to be this like dog shit defensive team that would always just run up as the scoreboard, but I think they're kind of worse than I expected them to be. Their offense does not look very crisp. And I think it's worth pointing out that when OBJ has a big game, look how the other weapons suffer. Both Landry and Njoku were not any good. Although Njoku did get hurt, but Landry didn't do very well. And I think with OBJ, he either pops off and has a really big game or he has poor performances. Yeah, definitely. Really inconsistent. In a good way. Kind Sometimes, at least. I think Evan Ingram is actually pretty good for a tight end. Yeah. He's going to get a lot of red zone targets. I mean, any any tight end that's getting around 10, 10 targets a week, which I think is where he's going to be, is going to be very, very good. It's a, it's a position scarce uh, part of you know part of a lineup. So if you can get, I mean, shoot, five, a lot of teams would go for a guy that consistently gets five targets, you know, some of the teams in our league. So you can't complain about a guy getting 10. Going forward, I don't like Sam's team. Michael Gallup just had an injury. He'll be out two to four weeks. And if I look at the rest of his team, he doesn't really have a deep bench in my eyes. Vinatieri is not going to be a good kicker with Brissett at the helm. 
And like I said, I'm not a fan of Diggs or Landry. Montgomery I consider also pretty weak. And I don't trust David Johnson or Jared Goff this season. I'm just not high on this team at all. What do you think about Sam's team? I don't, I don't like Montgomery very much for Chicago. Um, there are some weird timeshare stuff going on week one. Maybe it was kind of a fluky week. Maybe it won't continue. But I wasn't super high on him. He doesn't seem super efficient. The Bears' offense doesn't look particularly strong. I like David Johnson a lot, and they're u- finally using him like they should have last year in the passing game quite a bit. So I think he could provide some really interesting value with the spread, faster pace. He's going to get more opportunities. Um, I think that, you know, like last week he had a bad week against Baltimore, but, like, I think teams like, you know, Atlanta, Cincy, Carolina, they can really get in some, like, high-scoring, like, Texas Tech-style, like, spread games where, like, they run up 70 between them. And and I think he's, like, it's him, Fitz, and then uh, Kirk are going to be the beneficiaries of that type of game. So, I mean, he could be good for a touchdown or two a lot of these games. And if he gets 50 receiving yards, 50 rushing yards, I mean, that's that's going to be some solid point production, right? So I, 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 I'm not necessarily as down on Sam's team as you are, but I, I do think there's some, some holes that, you know, are kind of going to be insurmountable. I, I'd be really surprised if he made the playoffs as evidenced by Weston's power rankings. You know, I think we've talked about it. Other people have talked about it. It's just kind of a, a, a bad draft, I think, by him. And I don't think he's ma- a particularly strong, like, interseason manager. Like, he'll do – He's active at times, but it's not like I trust him like a like a Weston, who's pr- always pretty good at filling in his bench, you know. Yeah, and as far as Clatford Bacon's team goes, I think one really interesting thing is how he took his homer pick in Dak, and he took Mahomes, of course, in the first round, which was team-defining. And you run into this scenario where, even though Dak has played weak teams, Dak looks like a Leviathan. Everyone's saying that Dak has to be paid, give him a huge, disgustingly large contract. And Clap 4 sort of has him in the middle of doing really well. Now, knowing Clap 4, I don't think he's going to try to move Dak. But potentially, do you think that anyone could look to get a quarterback like this? Yeah, it, uh, it, does, it does seem to not make sense. But the Watsons have shown this propensity to roster too many quarterbacks. Um, even if it's clear that they have value and can fill in other pieces of their team, it's like they have this fear of like, oh, I'm going to have to get a guy off the waiver wire. I mean, there's about five guys this week I would feel pretty good about pulling off the waiver wire and starting. So, like, I don't know why people are always scared of that, particularly in this league where, like, so many teams are rostering, like, a bunch of quarterbacks. So I feel like the – there's, like it, – it's just it's just an interesting dynamic, I guess. And I'd, I'd be shocked if he traded – what I find interesting is, like, people are kind of the narrative you're talking about. Oh, we need to pay Dak. I mean, who the hell? He played He played gi- the Giants, like, Terrible jokishly defense. bad. Washington, who's better than we expect him to be, but still not good. He's playing Miami this week, so he's probably going to do well in limited. I, I would be shocked if he played more than about three quarters. Those are all bottom ten teams. Yeah, they're bottom ten teams. So let's see how he does against – let's look at the schedule. You probably know it by heart, but I don't. Yeah. Let's see, at New Orleans, yeah. I bet, bet he's going to look a lot yeah, worse. Yeah, Green a, Bay. There's a Patriots game. There's yeah. a New Orleans game. There's a Green Bay game. I mean, Dak has always been a good game manager. Uh, he's, he's been good at that. and he's, he's looking good in terms of passing this year. But like we said, he hasn't played any good teams. And he, he does have better weapons, but I, I would kind of sell high on Dak if I had Dak. Like, I think there's going to be worse days to come, and you can trick someone into thinking he's a top three QB right now. You know what I mean? Especially if they're a Cowboys homer. Well, there's not a lack of market in this league. Almost all the people in this league root for the Cowboys on some level. Yeah. And if you look at our drafts historically, Cowboys have always been overdrafted, drafted early. Yeah, there, there's some interesting things when we get to this week's matchup to discuss as well. Well, I think Clout 4 is actually looking solid and somewhat scary this year. Yeah, for, for sure. He's kind of a juggernaut. Again, uh, the thing, like, I guess in our division, it's kind of, I think it's pretty much between me and Jackson and, and Klopp for, um, the thing we can count on is sometimes Kevin is, he's better than, you know, his, his uh, offspring, but a lot of times he's still, uh, he still is not quite as good as a lot of the more, like, 
on top of it managers, you know. The seasoned youngsters. So, like, when bye weeks come around, I think that that could kind of, uh, that can kind of provide a couple of losses that maybe a better manager would have avoided. And then I do, I do think, like, he does still have kind of gaps in his team, you know. Yeah. Like, Henry, Henry and Chubb have been doing good, you know, but Chubb had a really bad week, and I think he could be up and down, like, Ken Allen's solid, Evan Ingram's good, but his other wide receiver slots aren't the best. I think the Cowboys' defense isn't, like, I think they're a middling option, and I just know he's going to ride or die with them, which, like, this week they're going to be amazing. Like, I'm, I love them this week, but they're not going to play Miami or the Giants. I mean, he played Washington, and they put it one point. That's, like, a bottom five offense. Like, the, or maybe not bottom five, but bottom ten at least. Like, the Giants are probably a bottom five offense, and they put up six. Like, these are matchups that you should be running up double-digit, you know, I turn 15, 16-point outings, and they're not. And I, I – stuff like this, it's small, but, like, all these little mistakes add up, and that's that's what kind of separates the people who consistently win week in and week out and year in and year out and the people who don't, you know. True. Okay, let's move on. We had Jameis' crab and go, which is you coming off of your horrific week one performance, beating your arch-rival Jackson. Yeah, this one felt pretty good. Um, I was pretty upset at myself after after week one. It was like all my players got the volume, but I didn't score a single touchdown. Like, I don't think any of my team scored a touchdown, so I put up like 60 or 70. And if I get three or four touchdowns, it looks a little better. Um, and then I think Clot 4 like popped off too, so it made me feel even worse, where it was just like, he dropped 130 on me and then, like, didn't score any touchdowns on my entire team, which is, like, I guess Jameis got one, but, like, all my receivers and running backs. And if you look, like, they all had the volume, you know, so I just – a little bit of run bad. Um, Would you beat 134? No, I wouldn't beat 134, but it's, like – it wasn't just the fact I lost. It was, like, I lost in, like, embarrassing fashion by 60. You got shit house. So yeah, like essentially. And then, like, even if I had scored, like, three more touchdowns and, like, put up, we'll say, like, around 90, it'd be like, oh, like, I put up 90, like... You still lose by 40, yeah, basically. Yeah, it's like, well, Jameis did horrible. Like, I was wrong on Jameis, so I'll just plug in, you know, Josh Allen, and then it would have been a 110-point outing. It's like, okay, well, that's okay, like, but, like, it just felt really bad. <laughs> yeah, Winston looked lost in this He game. looked horrible. That was, like, I was pretty down on him after that, but... why I plugged in Josh Allen because the Bills I'm buying I'm buying into the Bills as you know but the Bills are going to make the playoffs I think they're going to sneak in the wild card they finally put some weapons up there and then like Josh Allen is like he's like what made Cam Newton God tier like around 2012 2011 when basically the Panthers had no qualms about running him like 10 times a game 15 times a game they were more than happy to let him run in these rush touchdowns and now, like, in recent years, they've been a little more hesitant to do that. But, I mean, he's got the green light. And I'm thinking he got, like, 10 carries this week. Like, if a, if a quarterback's getting 10 carries, like, if they're a halfway decent runner, you're feeling pretty good. And Josh Allen's slinging it deep, and he's got, like, talented weapons to catch it deep. So I think he could be really, really good uh, this year. The Bills, just in general, could be. I mean, other than that, uh, I think Mark Andrews is a really interesting guy. One of the, the, if you picked him up, you know, I, I think he could be a top, you know, five tight end easily, maybe even higher. Really high on him. He's getting the looks. He's the security blanket for, uh, what's his face, uh, Lamar Jackson. Um, Jackson's looking strong. I kind of hate Kamara and Fournette at the backs position, and I'm not a huge fan of, like, Brita. Um, I think that it's always going to be a timeshare in San Fran. And I'm not even sure Breed is going to be the winner of the timeshare. So he's looking kind of weak at running back. And kind of his bench running back guys don't look great. But the rest of his team looks solid. And he kind of addressed one of the big question marks on his team, which was tight end, in my opinion. I, I, I think he was high on a Joku. But I think he dropped him already. So, like, I, I, I thought that when I looked at his team at the beginning, that was one of the weak points. And he already addressed that. But now it's looking like his running backs are weaker probably than expected. And obviously – Cam Newton is just a complete scam artist and a joke. Horrible. But, like, to me, you can address, like, he won't he won't feel as good as, like, Kevin, who's going to be able to plug and play, you know, Mahomes or whatever. But at the same time, like, 
I feel like like you can still waiver wire guys and like I don't hate it. He's a good manager and he'll fill in he'll fill in the gaps. So he's definitely a threat in this division for sure. Well, if we look at his bench, if he hadn't have flipped the Sammy Watkins coin, which to me, like, there's nothing more sure than Sammy Watkins doing poorly after putting up 30. But I mean, look, look, it's not even that bad. Like, look, look at he got the mo- he got 13 targets. Fair like, enough. if it's I just, see 13 targets on a guy, even if he didn't do though. anything, I'm not even mad at myself. It's like, okay, like, you get 13 targets, he's gonna put up like double digits guaranteed, like, in the next week, right? I I think he's, I I I the. When, this is coming from the the last podcast we listened, or when he did the power rankings, he was super high on Thielen, and that didn't really make sense to me, because I remember the the, the Vikings running it really heavily at the end of last year. So to me, it's weird. I get it's like concentrated weapons, but I didn't understand how high he was on Thielen. That like it was clear that they were shifting to a running centric that we've seen. Cook has looked amazing. It was just odd to me. He was so I. I don't think Thielen's bad, and I don't think he reached for him or anything. It was just he seemed like really high on Thielen. I. It was, seemed kind of weird to me. But maybe he expected Cook to get hurt really early. Yeah, I mean, I do think there's potential for Cook to get hurt, but if he's talented, and I think it. A lot into last year, you saw him finally getting healthy. He looked really good when he was healthy, and you know sometimes, sometimes these injury guys like his injuries seem kind of fluky. It wasn't just like, oh, I've always, you know, I've got a meniscus or whatever. Like, there's, like, injuries that always flare up, and I didn't really think his were the type that do that, like, when you come back from them strong, at least. So, Overall, what are your thoughts on your team? Do you feel good about your one-on-one start going forward? Yeah, the, I mean, the clout four is, like, I mean, I don't think I could have done anything that, that week. This week I kind of screwed up, and I saw Ronald Jones got, like, 20 carries or 20 touches. I was like, oh, like, I'll play Ronald Jones, and they gave him three touches this week, or four touches. It's just appalling. But uh, that's kind of my, my, my weak spot, as Jackson pointed out in the power ranking, is RB2. So I'm trying to uh, trying to address that, you know. I think I've got some guys who have shares of a backfield, and so I should be able to to maybe get fill that in, at least at a replacement level level. And that's really all I need to do to, to win games. My wide receiver depth looks amazing, I, I think, at least. So. Well, what about Jackson's team? Do you think he's going to be a big threat for this division going forward? It's tough to say. Um, to me, it, to me, Clafford's the bigger threat because, look, on a cert, like, I mean, he's a bigger threat than me too. I think Clafford's team is probably we're pretty close, I think, but his team is definitely like. He just has more pop-off potential from his, like, I think his wide receivers have more upside. I kind of I kind of always go for this consistent build uh, where I try to get consistency from every position, and I, I have that again this year. There really isn't an inconsistent position, you know. I'm going to get volume. I'm going to really no position will put up zeros like Clotfors did last year, but he just has absurd upside. Like, all of his guys, all his wide receivers can go for 30, you know, and mine, mine don't really – possess that level of upside um, and then Jackson like we'll see I think he's obviously he's obviously a threat like good manager he's got some pieces I think he might have a couple too many pieces to, to overcome the division um, particularly with me getting the the early lead and the you know tiebreaker stuff but who knows it's a long season and he manages well and he can address a couple positions and he's a threat all of a sudden you know Agreed. So here we saw one of the oldest rivalries in the league, Ben versus Cameron. We, we don't need to touch on this one too much. All right, well, let me at least do the intro, Spencer. <laughs> it's a rivalry as old as time, and Ben put up a very poor performance, and Cameron did about average or below the average in one. Hit the high notes on this one. <sighs> I mean, <can't, laughs> I almost can't even get it out. Ben's really bad. Him and Sam are probably going to be competing for the last last place, or not last place rather. There's really no position that like he got Bell, who I'm really low on. Rogers, he reached for him pretty hard. He kind of got thrown off by the Mahomes thing. It was odd. I really don't really like any of these guys on his team. Like, really not any. I'm not super high on. 
a um, bunch of timeshare guys. Edelman's value got took a horrible hit with Antonio Brown. Like any Bears receiver is probably not rosterable, and there's not a lot of help on the bench when you look there. I mean, this guy like the script the script got flipped last week, and Ronald Jones was week one beneficiary. So it's like, do you want to flip that coin? You know, probably not with his team. You know, he's got three better guys. I don't know. There's not a lot there. And then what's interesting is. Seagouch has a team that's that's actually kind of scary when you think about it, right? Like, yeah, it's just he, we know he's going to manage poorly. His wide receiver, like my my wide receiver too, I don't feel great about. But then I look at Cameron's and I'm like, holy shit! Like, I could start any of the five guys on my on my team and they would be better than his wide receiver too. Like, Dion Lewis, like what? Why? Why? Why do you? And he, I don't think he has another like. Does he have another running back on his roster? Like, it's not like oh, like he's got yeah. Yeah, well, I guess he's got Gordon, so maybe by, like, week 10, if he remembers to change his lineup then, like, he can put Gordon in, but things don't get better. <laughs> that is insane here, dude. But, yeah, I mean, Dion Lewis. there's not a lot to say here. Look at this. Fraud central. It's, it's just, you know, like, you know he's going to be bad, but he just, Dion Lewis. he doesn't even pick up guys off the waiver wire. Like, I don't know, I, it's weird. It's really weird, but I, I don't. It's not weird. We we've seen it year after year. We can go to the next one. We've already spent too much time on this atrocity. Fair enough. This is a really interesting one. No Fred puts up one or two and gets shit housed. Yeah, I mean this was like, this was probably like top three or four, uh, single week performances by Aaron. Oh, it's a great week for Rand. Like, I mean, we looked at his history, and it was like most, some years this was higher than every other production for a year. So, he kind of, it's funny, because he, he, he has he has a gaping hole at tight end, but obviously one, two, three, running back punch. He hit on every one. He's got decent wide receivers. Patriots defense looks like a great pick. Chiefs kicker looks great. Jackson can actually pass accurately enough, and they're still letting him rush ten times a game. I mean, what's not to like other than tight end. What I find kind of interesting is I think that Aaron could do a trade for, like, tight end where he addresses, like, tight end and he addresses, like, running back. Um, you know, as long as he doesn't get ripped off and someone has enough tight end depth, that could really help him because I think, like... What would he do part with one of these backs? Yeah, I would think, like, maybe, like, Eckler uh, or Cook for, like, think of a name that would make sense like maybe like a uh, Kittle yeah like it could be like Kittle in one of your backs maybe Damian Williams depending I don't know that that might not be quite value but that so that's kind of what I had in mind uh, if someone had that depth but I mean there's not much to say there I mean for on no on no fried side it's it's a good team he doesn't have a ton of gaping holes you know all around team. I'm not as high on John Ro- on John Ross. He's got pan hands, you know. And Ding. so it's it's really hard for me to like put a lot of trust in a guy who might like if you if you, if you, okay, if you really go and look at some of like the highlights from these games, he was wide open. Not a guy I should wily this, right? Yeah. Not a guy within 10 yards of him wide open. He probably could have broke it for like a t- tutty. The man like it was like he was playing ping pong with his hands. The ball, like, went back and forth, and then he dropped it. Like, to me, like, it's really hard for me to, like, want to play a guy like that because that, be, like, that could be the pass that's going to win you the week, and he just drops it for no reason. And I, I'm a little higher on Boyd, who's actually, I think, talented. And uh, I think some of the touchdowns, he hasn't had a touchdown yet, so I think some of these touchdowns will eventually start going to Boyd, which will also hurt Ross. But for a flex option, he's great. And there really isn't a position I don't think is filled for no fry. He's a pretty complete team and will definitely be a threat in that division. I agree. He looks like he is a solid performer with a pretty balanced team. You know, he's got Kelsey, who's the de facto best tight end in the league. Ryan's consistent. Both of his backs are okay. And then he has Fitz and Hopkins, who are both solid. This is a good team. But you look at Aaron. This is the best start Aaron has ever had. He said two torrential weeks, led by Lamar Jackson, who with all the rushing looks he gets is just a terror. And like you said, he hit on all three running backs. 
Melvin Gordon looks like he's not going to sign. So Eckler's just top tier in the meanwhile. Gurley is looking relatively healthy. You know, it's not like he's that knee issue is really flared up. And Dalvin Cook is looking healthy. Tyler Lockett and Amari Cooper are both huge parts of their offense. Harrison Butker, he's basically part of the best offense in the league. And the Pats have a pretty soft schedule. Yeah. What I think we'll be telling here is is Lamar Jackson, if you look at his week, so he played uh, – he played Miami, so there's not really a lot you can take from that week, even if you put up five tutties. I mean, probably tw- 20 of the quarterbacks in the entire league can do that against the Dolphins this year. And then against Arizona, spread, up pace, offense. Like, he looked good, but he also had some errant throws if you wa- if you actually watch the film like I do uh, on some of these players. So, like, he looked good, and, like, he has the cheat code, right? He had 16 carries. Crazy. 16 carries from a quarterback. You're happy if you get that from running backs. And he's doing it from – and and he's doing 24 passes. That's, like, insane. So he'll always have some amount of floor. I just don't buy, like, he's not going to have some more turnovers if he's throwing as errantly as he was in that game, which he had some really bad overthrows. He's always had a problem with under and overthrows and accuracy quite, quite a bit. He's got the arm strength, though. I think that Kansas City will be really interesting, but I think, like – down the stretch, when he plays some tougher uh, defenses, he might not look as good. So we'll see. The story right now for Aaron is staying hot. This is a guy who I think usually drafts decently well, and he'll start hot, but when the bye weeks hit, he'll start to choke and really make a lot of consecutive poor decisions. So I'm just really interested to see can Aaron not only stay hot, but actually deal with the bye weeks adequately. This is a guy who's relying on three very big question marks who are performing at the top tier right now. So there's a very high likelihood Gurley or Cook gets hurt or something either happens to Eckler or Gordon comes back. I mean, he, he's not going to keep performing. Like, like Cook, I think, is outperforming him, his, what is he probably should a little bit. Um, and I think Eckler is as well, just a hair. So both those guys will come down. I think Jackson is overperforming as well. I think Lockett is in, in – I think he might be like – I'm really high on DJ Metcalf. He's getting like – he's getting a ton of looks. He seems way more talented than Lockett. Like when you watch this guy, he's he's like matching up against these cornerbacks who have like 4-3 speed, and he's literally just beating them in a foot race. And, the, and he's 6-4, like built like Calvin Johnson essentially. Like it's insane how, how like physically talented he is. Um, and I, I think Lockett will have some value, but I think uh, I think DJ Metcalf's going to be the number one option in that offense. And then Dizzy will steal touchdowns, I think, as long as he's healthy. Gross. So Aaron just has to stay hot, and now we can finally go into the matchup previews. Oh, baby. You expect it to be a little longer when you haven't done an episode in a week. Want to start here? Yeah, why not? Right to left. So the king of funny, Ben Rogers, 0-2. Ben Reach for Aaron Rodgers, as I like to call him. Facing off against a team that just put up over 100 and lost. So, Spencer, what are your impressions about this matchup initially? Well, somehow NFL.com has no fried to lose. I don't know if I agree with that, personally. But, uh, yeah, to, to me, uh, what is it? Why is he starting Freeman? That's kind of odd. Is someone hurt? Because he had a better he had a better back before. Who who's on his bench? Wait, go, go back. Why? Did, what did he change? He's got something different. Who was his Marlon Mack? Maybe. Was that? Is he benching him now? Is that what it is? No, no, it was. It's, uh, Johnson, Keyshawn Johnson, or Carry on Johnson, yeah. So he's benching him now, which is kind of an interesting decision. Look at Freeman. That's a really dumb decision, I think. At Green Bay, the Green Bay is probably a top three defense this week. It doesn't really make sense to me, but maybe it'll work out for him. Yeah, that's a questionable, questionable decision to say the least. I mean. It's a timeshare. You're, you're, you're starting a guy who's in timeshare in a bad matchup. That might lose him this week, actually. It 
potentially. But anyhow, but yeah, let's go down from top to bottom. Aaron Rodgers is in a pretty good matchup against Denver. Uh, I think I like Rodgers slightly there. Bell's against New England. I think New England's going to key in on Bell and just shut him down at all costs and make and make the Jets throw the ball. Bell's going to be sub five points. Ingram uh, is probably going to beat that. Though they're, it's going to be a, it's going to be a bloodbath in, in Kansas City this week. Like they're going to run up the scoreboard. I'm fairly certain of it. Mac, Mac and Freeman. Uh, I guess Mac. Don't love him, but Freeman's in a timeshare in a horrible matchup. Kind of low on Edelman. Fitz has looked really good, and the Carolina game could kind of shoot out a little bit. Uh, maybe not a crazy amount, but I think there'll be some there'll be scores to be had. I think a New England's going to just kind of run the clock out, I feel like. So I think that hurts some of the receivers this week. Hopkins over Robinson. I hate Bears receivers. They're a joke. Kelsey over Olsen. The Olsen will be decent. Uh, here, Buffalo has a, has a, I think, a decent – they've kind of shut down their opponents, So and I hate Ross, as I discussed earlier, so I'm going to give Lindsey the edge. He's in a timeshare, but I think he's the he's the, the leader of the timeshare. I think it, he could get a – he's really one of the few weapons they have, so he could easily punch it in this week, um, which would be all you need. Uh, kicker and defense, uh, I like Vikings – over 49ers, I like, <laughs> I I guess I like Guskowski. Playing the Jets, it's a good matchup. But they're just going to score five touchdowns, and that's five points. Like, <laughs> that's the that's why it's hard. But, yeah, not too not, not so much to see here. I think, I think I got to give the edge to, uh, got to give the edge to no fraud, but it should be by more. He's kind of outmanaging himself by starting Royce Freeman, which I think is kind of dumb. And if Ben wins, it'll likely be because of that fact, I would guess. So as each week passes, Ben changes his name to a different Metallica song from Ride the Lightning. Initially, it was Fade to Black, and now it's For Whom the Bell Tolls. I'm just a little concerned that whenever he's 0-8, he's going to have to change it to Trapped Under Ice. Because right now, Ben has a lot of depth on his bench that he's really hoping and waiting on to save him. A.J. Green, Kareem Hunt. I think he's going to be out of it by the time these dudes get back. This is a flimsy team. Davion Bell plays for a joke organization. Marlon Mack doesn't have a real quarterback. Yeah, he missed He missed on a lot of picks for sure. I don't think he hit on any of his picks. Would you say he hit on any of those picks? Aaron, like He took Aaron Rodgers in the second round. Yeah, he's, and I'm pretty sure he's like sub-20. Like he's, he's not in the top 20, right? Yeah, he's not in the top 20. He hasn't so even it's like 15 points. That's his second-round pick for a quarterback, a position that's easily replaceable. Yeah, it, it was just a really bad draft from him. But let's go to the next one. We've seen enough. I've given no fry the edge here. Easily. All right, here we have Ramphy versus Cam. Yeah, interesting one. Oh, damn. <laughs> Fraud central. Guarantee you. I will lay a hundred dollars that unless like he's not gonna fill that running back slot. It's oh, gonna be on. empty. It's gonna be empty. No way. Well, like, I'm not gonna. T- you're gonna like spam text until he changes it. But like, it's uh, barring no one like repeatedly telling him that would a hundred percent be em- empty. But who is? It? Let's let's just try to guess who's gonna put in. <laughs> I mean, it's gotta be Burkhead, right? Yeah. Like, it's the only active running back on his team. Actually, not a bad fill-in, uh, especially when you consider the manager. But, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it might not even happen, you know. Anderson's a good start, like I said, that'll shoot out, I think. And he's really their main. They're gonna shut down. They're gonna stack the box, so he's gonna be probably one-on-one. I like that. McCaffrey will be really good this week. Watson's not in a great matchup, but he always has upside. Uh, let's see. Vance McDonald's been getting a lot of looks. This actually could be closer if he actually puts in Burkhead. This actually could, not close, but let's just assume he puts in Burkhead because we'll just laugh at him sure, if he doesn't. Sure, sure. Bears in a really juicy matchup. He, 
This actually could be Aaron's first loss, potentially. I wouldn't say it's likely, but it's not out, out of the realm of possibility. Dude, the Rams are going to eat up the Cleveland defense. Greg the going to have a good day. Yeah. I don't know. He, he, the, the thing that, that Cameron has going for him is I, I don't – people are buying, like, this narrative that, like, the Cowboys are going to stomp Miami in, and they're, and they're right. But, like, that's going to be good from a fantasy perspective, right? I could very easily see, like, they might not have a single first stringer playing in the second half. I know that's an absurd statement. That's essentially what the Ravens did to, to, to Miami. Like, they put in RG3 for, like, almost the second half. Like, I, I just think that that could, and they, like, that could, like, potentially end up in Cooper and Witten having off weeks and, you know, being limited volume. Uh, I don't know. I could see a path to Cameron winning, but you got a favor. I don't, we don't have to do positional stuff. I think Aaron has to be the favorite, but not to discount Cameron's ability to win before the bye weeks. Yeah, Aaron still looks red hot until one of those backs go down. He's going to be nearly untouchable. I think the Jason Witten pickup is sort of funny because he Witten is actually getting red zone looks. Like he's had a touchdown both weeks. I just think it's really gimmicky. And of I course, th- it's a cowboy homerism. Of course, it's. Gonna yeah, I just think it. I'd be shot. Like he could go two weeks without scoring a touchdown, and then he has sub two points. You know, it's like okay. All right, this week Spencer plays Sam, and this is one of these games where you need to win by thirty to prove a point, Spencer. I, I would take a win by one. Fraud. I think Allen versus Golf. They're both gonna have great weeks. You're gonna actually start old Mozart this time. Yeah, I'm actually still going up in the air. So, I actually can start Deshaun McCoy, who's the going to be the de facto lead back in that uh, in that game. Um, but he's still he's still questionable, and I'm I really bu- I'm buying into Mo- Mozart. He actually led the touches in the San Fran backfield over Brita last week, and even if he has ten touches, he's so explosive that I, don't know, I feel like I feel like it's I'm, I'm it's worth fl- throwing a, throwing a coin up in the air and. I think uh, he just has more upside, and I think that against Pittsburgh they could run up a lead and want to. They could have more running, you know, looks than normal, right? But really, none of my options are amazing. They're all kind of just trying to. They're kind of just speculation on, on backfields. But I would, I definitely favor David Johnson over Mozart. And of course, you favor Saquon over Montgomery. Not even close. And I think Tyler Boyd and Mike Evans, they'll both do well. But you have to give Evans the advantage of playing against terrible Giants defense. I think it'll be a Tampa Bay resurgence this week. I think they'll look not great, but they'll look better than they have been. And there'll be some touchdowns to go around, and I think Evans will end up with one of them. I give Smith-Schuster the edge over Diggs because Smith-Schuster has not only a good matchup relatively, but... It's not a good matchup. San Francisco is is pretty solid, but... I think that the back, the, the quarterback that came in might actually be better for Smith Schuster than Ben. Mm-hmm. So like, I think that bumps up Ben's value. What's his name? Rudolph something or Mason Rudolph maybe. I don't know. I think he, he looked very accurate and he looked like he liked Juju. Good. Like he was forcing it in. So. Good. Zach Ertz and Ebron, I think, are both good options. Zach Ertz should have more yards though. Uh, is he is Ebron a good option? Sometimes, I, I I think you you may have over overrated him with a, an okay option. He's like a desperation start maybe during bye weeks, but I think Ertz has a clear advantage, and I think Ertz could go for two touchdowns because the this is a Phillies team without all of their primary weapons. Remember, they're missing Alshon Jeffrey, Goddard, the backup tight end, and Deshaun Jackson. So it's basically going to be Aguilar and Ertz this week. Against a, a matchup, you know, that doesn't have the best secondary. I mean, this could be a two, two touchdown Earth's performance, I think. A beautiful matchup for Earth's owners. If Frank Gore plays, he'll do well because Singletary's hurt. Cooper it, Cup looked good last week, though. Gore's upside's limited because he's just a bad player. He's just like, he's just not, he's just old over the hill. He's going to average three yards a carry, but he's going to get 20 carries and he'll. He might punch it in once, you know, and that's can't complain from a flex. That's probably that might beat a cup the way he's been playing, you know. 
Cup has more upside, though, I think, because Cup could go for 20, you know? <laughs> Got the best kicker in the league. Tell me about this. So I had this theory that Cam Newton wasn't going to rush as much, which I thought was going to hurt their red zone efficiency. So my way of it, it, uh, expressing that view was they'll get a lot of field goal attempts. And I saw this guy had a lot of, like, 50-plus – like. He looked like he was very consistent from 50 plus looking his like preseason numbers. So he has that ability too, which kind of helps kickers. So I took the stat of this guy and he's been decent so far. You know. I love it. I love his beard. Rank one. Amazing. Oh, he's got to get, well, he's got to get the advantage over Vinatieri. For sure. Here's a, a little closer matchup, I think. Yeah, I think I favor you, though. Oh, yeah. I, I think that you're going to take this. I think I'm not being a homer if I say I feel like my team is just overall stronger than Ben's. Or uh, not Ben's, uh, Sam. Sam's, but I think it's also stronger than Ben's. Hand. Okay, here we have a game that actually has some action on it. Jackson and Clap 4. Oh, this is a good one. Fournette somehow put up positive yards after being terrible for the first half. God. He had like negative six rush yards at one point at, at halftime, I think. Yeah, that game was just horrifically bad. That was one of the worst football games I've ever watched. It's pretty awful. Just so boring. Just teams trying to run it up the gut and losing four yards. Like that happens so many times you wouldn't believe. But Dak Prescott's going to have a good day versus Miami. Yeah. It, interestingly enough, um, as I said, it could be one of those things where, like, sometimes a matchup can be too good where you just don't have the opportunity. So you could, Dak could go for, like, 20 and then not play in the second half. And Winston, you know, I don't see them pulling away far enough from the Giants where he's not going to play the whole game, you know. So what Winston has a little more upside, I think, than Dak potentially just because he's going to play more. I just really wonder how early they're going to pull those starters. I mean, I know Miami is bad, but uh, when will they pull the back, put the backup well, in? I just think it's going to be a different game script, right? It's not going to be like when they're playing a team like the the you know the Packers or someone where they're going to throw it out. Like They might just be run heavy, and I think that that could hurt Dak. You know? So I think Zeke is going to do really well this week. Against Miami. I like Zeke too, but they, they might... They might just go to the second stringers earlier, like across the board. That's my fear from a fantasy perspective. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I think it's good to think of all the possible outcomes, and that's kind of my lean has been Cowboys are going to win so hard it's going to hurt their weapons a little bit. But their defense, though, will be amazing. Like, holy cow. Miami can't score. Yeah, so it's a guaranteed 10, and you know they're going to get at least four or five sacks, so that's like 20. So, like... That's 20 from the defense, you know. Packers are in a good matchup too, though. Yeah, Denver's pretty inept. Very boring to watch. Just horrific, bo horrific boredom. I think Brett Maher is in for a pretty good day, though. Yeah, could, again, might be a lot of extra points, not enough field goals, you know what I'm saying. Low floor. Yeah. And Tucker, I think that that game will shoot out, and there might be a couple of... Uh, couple ones that come up short so and he's actually like a, one of the more talented kickers in the league he's been nuts dude filthy I think I gotta edge um it's close but I think I have to edge Jackson what do you think yeah I like Jackson's team better here as well it's pretty close though yes it is I would be honest, this is weird to be worried about a defense, but after what Aaron's Patriots defense did last week with dropping 37, I think you've got to be worried the boys get like 20 here. Yeah. That could be something that's difficult to overcome. I mean, Miami's going to be the best def the, the best team to target against from a defensive perspective, I think, all year. Oh, they're a laughing stock. The NFL should threaten to relegate them. And, and they, they blatantly, like, are tanking. They traded away their best defensive player to the Steelers. <laughs> like, their cornerback. Well, is Tua Tungavailoa really worth tanking for? I don't know, man. I don't feel like he's one of those 
unmissable number one overall picks, I give Jackson the advantage. I mean, how many, like, think about this. How many Alabama quarterbacks have truly been, like, non-miss? Not many. Okay, is there even one that's a starter? There was that McKinnon guy who was a backup and got some starts. But, like, can't miss, like. No, no. It's a, they're system quarterbacks. They they have this amazing O line in college, and then on top of that, they have amazing backs and typically above average receivers. I don't think it, Alabama is like a receiver powerhouse. So they have some well, they have, they usually have three really good guys running it, three different really good running backs. So I feel like it's like kind of a system in, in a weird way. It's like a system quarterback, and then they win a lot, so people get high on them. It's not like Cle- like Clemson with Deshaun Watson, where he just was like one v elevening, you know, just going crazy. Very true. In looking at this matchup, we have to note that Drew Brees will not, of course, be playing. He's going to miss six droopy weeks because of a thumb injury. But don't worry, Lily has three quarterbacks. She can go Baker Mayfield, who's coming off of a filthy win. She can go Stafford, who's playing Philly. What would you do? I think Mayfield, how did he end that last game, though? That would. I felt like he looked decent at times. 15 points. Yeah. He looked kind of sloppy against Tennessee, but I, I think I would take him. I just think Stafford's upside's limited, and Philly's pretty good defensively. So I think Philly's overrated, honestly. Really? Yeah, I think they're solid, but I've seen some people saying they were going to win but like 13, 14 games. I think that's way high. Yeah, that's a touch high, but, I mean, they're very, very good at using personnel and, like, they, they have, like, a very good, like, next man up mentality. Like, I feel like they always are injury ravaged every year, and they always, like, seem to do a good job of filling in those gaps from, like, trades or, like, the, their backups, you know. And they uh, – was it Doug Doug Peterson? Is that his name? Or, the lineman? No, the coach. Is it Doug, uh, Doug Marone? Whatever their head coach's name. He does some really, really nice, like, scheming. Like, one of the, he's one of the better schemers. Like, he's up there with, like, Andy Reid, I would say. So they're going to scheme well, even with, like, not as good players. Not, I don't know. I think coaching can be really underrated sometimes. Interesting. So Joe Mixon had that injury. I believe it was a knee. And he was a little banged up in week two, but he's going into week three without an injury designation. He's facing off against James Conner, who's been on a fucking terrible offense with a new quarterback now, so... I might even edge that to Mixon, honestly. I have a hot take. I think they'll both be sub five points this week. Blister. That's pretty hot. (laughs) Those are both, like, RB1s. Well, what do you think about the next running back matchup, Jones versus Jacobs? This is a little more interesting. I think i got to do Jones, though. Really? Yeah. I think Jones will need to run it out a lot. I actually favor Jacobs here, I think. Really? Yeah, I, I feel like he gets more looks, and he's a bigger part of his offense. I think the Packers' offense really runs through Aaron Rodgers heavily. Yeah. And without Antonio Brown, the Raiders are really just trying to figure out how to punch it in. Sure. O- Odo Beckham Jr. had a great week last week. I don't think he'll have a great week this week. I think Robert Woods will finally break 10. What do you think? Yeah, that seems reasonable. Okay. I think uh, I think Odell Beckham will have a good week, though. Okay. I, I like Woods breaking 10, but I think Odell Beckham might break 20. So. Wow, 20. Is that your official number that you're going to put on that over 20? Why not? Alrighty. We'll do 18 and a half. Okay. I think Brandon Cooks will also do well. I think this Cleveland game is going to be a shootout. I think the Browns also might shit the bed, and it might just be a stomp by St. Louis, or the L.A., rather. But I think Adams will have a great day, and he has the advantage over Cooks. I think Woods will take Cooks's production, uh, so I think Cooks will not have a, a mi- terrible day, but not have a great day either. So. Okay. Can uh, old Jared Cook beat 6.4? Will Cook beat 6.4? The tight end matchup. One of them's oh, played. my bad. So I was thinking Cooks, the guy above him. It's a little confusing. Let's see. Probably not. Yeah, I don't think so either. Yeah. And 
All the rest is relatively uninteresting. Is Samuel starting? What, what, what the hell is up with that? Oh, never mind. It's Lily. It... Who the hell knows, dude? So it's so hard to look into some of these matchups, dude. Like I we that's why I like wait till after Thursday. Well, it's like you don't know if she's even gonna pick someone up off the wire or just put in one of these guys. Like it's, it's just so tough. I think you gotta give it to uh, Wes here, right? Sure. I don't love I don't love it, but I think he's got some good matchups on tap, and he's got uh he's got the edge. Agreed. Finally, we have the matchup everyone's been waiting for: me versus the Gouch. The Gouch. So Tom Terrific is facing off against Philip Rivers. Brady is going to just eviscerate the Jets. I think Philip Rivers, after laying an egg last week, will do an average to above average against Houston. Yeah, I think uh, they'll both do good. I think uh, there is some, some blowout risk with Tom Brady. The Patriots do like to run it out with Sonny Michelle. And what sucks is he has Sonny Michelle, so that could really, like, could really hurt you some. That's true. What do you think about Zeke this week? I know you talked a lot about run, running ups. The I, I think he's guaranteed ups. to get 15. Like I think 15 is the floor this week, right? Oh, you're right. And and if they're if they're like willing to like not pull him, then like he could go for like 25 or 30, like easily. Like I know that's kind of an absurd thing to say, but like, who's their backup? Like they, I feel like the Cowboys are willing Pollard, to ride Tony Pollard. I feel like the Cowboys are willing to ride backs harder than like a lot of other teams are. So obviously that beats Jamal Williams. Yeah. This matchup is fucking terrifying for me. Because I have the Sony Michelle blocker. I think Zeke is going to get like 22, honestly. Yeah. And Phillip Rivers, it's not terrible, but it's solid, you know? Yeah. But between Zeke, he has the Sony Michelle blocker, Zeke is going to do great. And he has a pretty good quarterback. I think that's just pretty scary to look at overall. But I'm not really scared of DJ Moore. I'd be a little scared. How come? Uh, I, I think people are sleeping on the, the backup for, for them. Panthers. I think he's going to be better for the receivers than Cam Newton was, right? It'd be harder to be worse. And, you know, Moore got, a, Moore got 14 targets last week, so the volume's there. He's just not quite punching it in. So that could help him some. He's playing against Air, Arizona. I just think there's going to be a lot of points to go around in that game. And then Marquise Brown has, like, absurd upside in this matchup. Like, they're really the only two weapons that Baltimore uses from a receiving perspective are that Andrews guy and, tight end. and Brown. So it's like he's going to get probably ten targets, and, like, he could punch it in twice. Like, Brutal. It's, it's really – I would be very scared if I were you. Oh, I am. Not necessarily DJ Moore, but overall – O.J. Howard, what do you think about this clown? He was, he's been horrible, but uh, straight dog shit. But I think he's gonna bounce back some against the Giants. You know, maybe around ten, eight to ten. He's got old DeVote. DeVote. He's been dog shit. Yeah, this guy's awful. Super untalented. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I don't like. The, this news note's like exactly like I can't tell if he's just still hurt or if he has just been bad or like if the Falcons O line is horrible or like what. I just I'm super low on him and like I think he's gonna probably get hurt and even if he doesn't he's gonna be ineffective. So when you see Devote you wanna grab all of his his dreadlocks, get him in your hand, squeeze real tight and pull him over your back like a rucksack, don't you? Sure. Uh, Devote's a joke, and this has come from someone who's had him for like five years. I think Randall Cobb is going to have a great week in Miami because of Michael Gallup's injury. So I was psyched to pick him up off the waiver wire. Yeah. What are your other options on the bench? On the benchy bench, I got Coleman, who's not going to play. Singletary's out. Williams is out. I, I would play Sanders over. But they're playing Miami. But, but look at his look at his game game log. Number one option. You know they're going to be playing from behind. 
pretty freaking good, man. He's the number four wide receiver at the bench. I know you're like high on that, but remember, if they go to the Zeke game flow, I don't know. I disagree with that. I would probably start Sanders, but you know, do what you want to do. Uh, so yeah, and then I guess I like. Oh, this is tough. I, the kickers are about to push for me. I think I edge Bills over Seahawks. I think the Bills are going to demolish the Cincy. Good. Embarrass them. Like, they're going to hold them to, like, a touchdown or two and then just demolish them. So I think I have to edge uh, Seagouch here. I think his team is uh, on the upswing, and I think you've got some, some holes that I don't think you're effectively filling enough to, to favor. And he kind of hedges. <laughs> I, I don't believe in this too much, but he does kind of hedge out your Tom Brady with the Sonny Michelle. Whereas, like, if Brady goes off, you know they're going to run it back with Michelle. So, like, kind of neutralizes Brady a hair. I wouldn't say it's like a pure hedge, but it definitely kind of intuitively would help. I'm going to give myself the edge in this, but barely. Homerism. Homerism in its purest form. Alright, so that's the video. Spencer, do you have any final thoughts about this league? Yeah, I think uh, you want to go to... Let's, let's look at the divisions really quick, kind of see what... what What's on the line? So I think if uh, I think if Christian wins this sh this week, that kind of props him into contention, you know, pretty 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 well. So that's a big week for him. If he loses this, he's kind of out of it, right? Because he's basically like with both you and Weston, he's kind of competing for a wild card, like at this point, right? Like, is that like a crazy thing to say? It's probably too early, but makes it way harder for him. Yeah. I should be able to take out Sam this week. Destroy him. So that you puts, gotta win by twenty. That puts me at two and one, and then I think Clat Four probably wins again. And then Jack is Jackson playing Clat Four again? Yeah. 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 So that drops Jackson down a notch. Jackson can win though, uh, but yeah, that would be pretty brutal for him. Be a big uphill battle. I think Aaron probably goes to probably goes to three and zero, oh, which is really interesting because. No fright has one of the, a top half team, but he's about to be 3 Is that recoverable? Probably not. And Ben is off in La La Land. Might as well, you know. I think he's either signed out or his team is so fucked that he's not a threat. And then if you, no matter what happens to Cameron, if he's your main threat, my God, wrap yeah. the division up. I it's pretty much get wrapped, get gift wrapped for Aaron. If you owe his team though, I, the the one noteworthy thing that I thought was. I've already touched on this some. I just don't think his I don't think his bench is that good. Like I look at his bench and it's just like he's got a dolphin. Like Mister Be Active on the waiver. Duke, wire. Duke Johnson lost the has lost the backfield. Hides the main guy, uh, and it's not really an even timeshare. Like Danny Amendola got zero points last week. Um, it's like like there's nothing here that's like scary. Like Mike Williams is like the third or fourth receiving threat for the for the Chargers. Like Josh Josh Gordon has basically been replaced by Antonio Brown. Like awful. And he, and if he hasn't, like they just have too many weapons, too many mouths to feed. Like you've got James White, Sonny Michelle, Rex Burkhead is going for 100 yards a week. That's just like, in the backfield. Yeah, and the back, well, it's receiving too. So Josh Gordon, Edelman, Antonio Brown. They're just like a it's like a plethora of weapons, and like. They have, like, another receiver, like, a fourth receiver had, like, 50 yards last week. There's just too many weapons for me to feel great about any of the – any of their weapons. And I think Josh Gordon is, like, one of the – he's the biggest loser of the Antonio Brown thing, I would say. Because they're the same player, right? Like, they're very similar, at least. Yeah, Brown's just way better. So, Aaron's vulnerability, I think, will, will show during the bye weeks. But his – or if there's an injury, but if neither the, if if injuries don't happen, I mean the divisions get wrapped, get in, wrapped for him. In week four, he should still be. If even if he loses and he's not red hot, his team should still have a lot of pieces together. He's probably not going to lose Cook and Jackson in one week, you know. Yep. And he'll be playing you. How do you feel about this matchup? This will be a really big one. Not good. You know, anything can happen week to week. Um. But yeah, I know 
it's not not a fun one for me for sure. <laughs> yeah, this could be brutal. Cooks against Chicago, so that's kind of nice. But yeah, it's it's brutal. I I I need to win this week just because that's likely a loss, and they'll put me at two and two, which is recoverable. But one and three likely isn't. Not too much more to, to say. I would say. Yeah, alright, we're wrapping the video. Make sure you like a like leave a like rating and sub for more.